even in the things we cannot see. It's hard sometimes, but it's the way for me. Things I saw begin to fall and slowly fade away. The things the Lord has shown me are in my heart to stay. So if all I ever do is one. only to discover that his chute was broken. Plunging to the ground, he saw another man on the way up. Hey, he yelled frantically to the man, do you know anything about parachutes? No, shouted the man, do you know anything about gas grills? <laughs> okay, free, <son. laughs> I thought you might free us up <laughs> Amen. Look at somebody and say, I'm in love with Jesus. Hallelujah. The Lord has impressed my heart today. I hope this will be a message of encouragement, maybe to some of you that have started out in, in some type of ministry at some point. I hope this will uh, enlighten you today and, and encourage you. Turn your Bibles, if you will, to 2 Kings chapter 6. 
2 Kings chapter 6, verses 1 through verses 7. And I love to talk about Prophet Elijah and then his trainee, Elisha. The Bible says that one day the group of prophets came to Elisha and told him, As you can see, this place where we meet with you is too small. Let's go down to the Jordan River where there are plenty of logs. There we can build a new place for us to meet. All right, he told them, go ahead. Please come with us, someone suggested. I will, Elisha said. So he went with them. And when they arrived at the Jordan, they began cutting down trees. But as one of them was cutting a tree, his axe fell into the river. Oh, sir, he cried, it was a borrowed axe. Where did it fall, the man of God asked. When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it into the water at that very spot. And then, he, and then the axe head floated to the surface. Awesome. Then the axe head floated to the surface. You didn't misunderstand. I read that right. Then the axe head floated to the surface. Grabbed it, Elisha said. The man reached out and grabbed it. Father God, in the name of Jesus. I'm so very thankful, Lord, for your sweet, sweet Holy Spirit for Your presence in this house today. Thankful, God, that You and You alone are God. And Lord, I humbly stand in Your presence and in the presence of these wonderful people today. And I ask for Your precious anointing. Lord, You know how I feel about that. Lord, if You're not going to anoint me, just speak to me now and I'll sit down because I cannot do it without You and I recognize that. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you will go before me just now. Wrap your arms around everyone this morning. And God, if there's anyone here today that will be listening to this service on YouTube this week that does not know Jesus, oh God, let this be their moment in time. And Father, I pray that you will just encourage your people today. Lift us up in your presence. Be with us, God. And we will be careful and cautious always to give that matchless eternal name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, honor and praise and glory. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. When they arrived at the Jordan, they began cutting down trees. But as one of them was cutting a tree, his axe fell into the river. I want to use uh, for a subject this morning for a few moments. What to do when you lose your spiritual edge. What to do when you lose your spiritual head. I want to introduce this sermon this, uh, this morning. But I want to say first, it is so vitally important for the church of Jesus Christ to maintain a spiritual edge. Amen. It is so vitally important. There are some things that we as believers may could afford to lose, but we never want to lose our spiritual edge. Amen. And if you have anyone under my voice today, if you have lost your spiritual edge, I pray that the Holy Spirit will help you through this word this morning to be encouraged and regain yes. that spiritual edge. Yes. The story we're looking at in, in this message took place in the 8th century B.C. During the times of the kings when Israel was split into two kingdoms. Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And after the prophet, after the prophet Elijah was taken up away into heaven in a fiery chariot, in the original Hebrew it says Elijah went up in a storm into heaven. Ever how he went? My, that must have been a glorious, glorious experience. But this is when the prophet Elisha began his ministry. Elisha had trained under Elijah for many years preparing for ministry. I read something, I'm not sure uh, how uh, concrete it was, but I read something this week that there was a suggestion that Elisha or Elijah may have tutored and mentored Elisha for some 50 years. But he couldn't have had a greater mentor than Elijah. Amen. I thought about just briefly some in my younger years, just four or five years ago. Yeah. So, 
how important that they were to me and how that their mentorship helped me. I'm thinking about one particular person, uh, C.T. Davis, and some of you that are uh, over 60 probably will remember him. But, but such a, a great man of God, uh, such wisdom. Uh, I, I love to be in the same room he was in. It seemed like that he, he stood above. Uh, he, he, had, he had such wisdom just seemed to radiate uh, from him. But Elijah had trained, Elisha had trained under Elijah for many years preparing for his ministry. Elisha is now training other young prophets. This is what is meant by a group of prophets. The King James says, sons of prophets in verse 1. And according to verse 1, this school of the prophets had become so large that they had grown their current place and needed to build something larger to accommodate their growing enrollment. When I said in two days of a youth convention, I think there was four or five pastors in our region out of 80 some of us that were there. I thought, Lord, I wish we could get to the place where that more uh, young men and or young women were being called of God and that we would have to enlarge some of our tents and our, our places of training. Yeah. The anxious prophets approached Elisha, their teacher, with this request in verse 2. Let's go down to the Jordan River, they said, where there are plenty of logs. There we can build a new place for us to meet. All right, Elisha told them, go ahead. In other words, Elisha was sending them off on this building task with his blessings. He wasn't planning on accompanying them until one of the prophets approached him and requested that he go with them. They wanted Elisha there for inspiration. They weren't expecting him to help them with the strenuous work of putting up the building. They just wanted Elisha there for inspiration. Having their teacher there to watch them would be a great source of strength and encouragement for the task. Yeah. And when they arrived at the Jordan River, they immediately began to work on cutting down trees. Each student doing his part. Pretty soon, a problem arises. How many know when you attempt to do something for God, That's right. problems That's right. arise? Amen. Amen. No matter how small the task, Amen. no matter how great the task, right. just as soon as you determine in your heart that God is calling you, that God is touching you and speaking to you about something that will be a blessing, something that will be encouraging, something that will minister to and in the kingdom of God. And just as soon as that happens, problems will arise. I want to encourage you this morning, if problems have arisen in something that God has called you to do, that God maybe has separated you unto Himself to do, I want to encourage you today, don't lose your spiritual edge. You just hold on to your faith. You just cling to the old rugged cross. You just keep your heart and your affection set on things that are above, not on things that are on this earth. And God and the Trinity of heaven will minister to you and keep you where Amen. He desires you to be. Amen. But pretty soon, problems arise. While cutting down a tree, one of the young men has his axe head fall into the river and it sinks to the bottom. Yeah. Listen, the young prophet lost his axe head. He lost his cutting edge. He lost his effectiveness in doing the work he had set out to do. I have a question. Have you lost your cutting edge? Have you lost your spiritual sharpness? Have you lost your effectiveness? Have you lost your enthusiasm for doing the work the Lord has called you to do? Yeah. And if I could just simply break this down, I would like to ask you this individually. I know we're all here in the same room together. But I would like to make this an individual question, not just a collective question. But I would like for these to be individual questions. Ask yourself. I'm asking myself. Have you lost your cutting edge? Have you lost your spiritual sharpness? 
Have you lost your effectiveness? Have you lost your enthusiasm for doing the work God has called you to do? Proverbs 27 and 17, iron sharpens iron. So one man sharpens another. Listen carefully. If your axe is dull, it still continues to be an axe. If your axe is dull, it's still an axe. But it is less effective. I started to bring you an axe. I have an axe and axe handle and some stuff, but I didn't want to hurt me. <laughs> no, no, I am going to do it. Luther could have held that. Luther could have held that for me. <laughs> and just for a few moments here, I, 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 really want to, I really want to dig into this this morning. I want to examine three things that you can do to recover your spiritual age. Number one, some don't like to hear this, but number one, you must accept responsibility for losing your spiritual age. Amen. Amen. Verse 5 said, As one of them was cutting a tree, his axe head fell into the river. Oh no, oh sir, he cried. It was a borrowed axe. Now the King James Version says, Alas, master, I, it was borrowed. The word alas literally means, Oh no. Isn't that what you cry out when you've lost something? Oh no, I've lost my car keys. Oh no, I've lost my wallet. Oh no, I've lost my glasses. Some of us as we keep continue to grow older. Oh no, I've lost. I've lost my... <laughs> the young prophet cried out. Oh no, master. I've lost my axe head. It was borrowed. The fact that this man had lost something that didn't belong to him took on even greater significance. Yeah. He lost something that wasn't his to lose. Yeah. He lost something that belonged to another. Yeah. However, he didn't blame anyone else for what happened. The young prophet took full responsibility for the borrowed action. In essence, what he cried out was, Oh no, Master, I have lost the cutting edge. I was borrowing from someone else. Yeah. Church, when you lose your spiritual cutting edge, you must accept personal responsibility for it. Now listen carefully. You can point the finger at the preacher and say, I lost my spiritual edge because the preacher's sermons are boring and they don't feed me. I hope you can't say that here, but that's what some people say. Because the preacher's sermons are boring and they don't feed me. You can point your finger at the church and say, I've lost my spiritual edge because our church doesn't offer programs that fulfill my personal needs. And that is something that we all need to give more attention to. But that's not my point. You can say, I lost my spiritual edge because my job takes me away from too much church. But when the truth, but the truth is, when you lose your spiritual edge, the blame lies with you. Isn't it strange that we live in a, a day and a time nobody wants to be responsible for anything. Amen. 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 <laughs> and everybody's sorry for the error only after they're caught. That's right. That's right. Nobody wants to take on. Few want to take on the responsibility anymore when there's a failure, when there's an area that needs much attention, or when there are, are the things that have happened that we would rather they had not happened, nobody simply wants to step up and say, that's my fault, I'm responsible for that, I didn't pray like I should have prayed, I didn't seek the face of God like I should have sought the face of God, and the list goes on and on, even professional people. I don't want to call out anything this morning because I don't want to be offensive to anyone. But I'm so weary. Matter of fact, I'm sick and tired of dealing with professional people. 
You can't pay a bit more attention to some professional people than I can fly. How many know I can't fly? <laughs> We're, this church is doing business with a certain company. I have made three or four telephone calls to correct the error that they made. This church didn't make it. Sister Pat didn't make it. I didn't make it. You didn't make it. They made it. And I haven't even gotten a courtesy call back yet. And which, guess what I'm going to do tomorrow? I'm going to fix it. <laughs> They're either going to do something about it or we're going to change companies. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> what you got to do what you're preaching. I'm not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say that. <laughs> you must... Accept full responsibility. And you must understand also that when you have lost, that what you have lost is something you have borrowed. It's a horrible thing to lose. Borrow something from someone and then lose it. Amen. God, listen carefully. And you must understand also that when you have lost, what you have lost is something you have borrowed. God has entrusted you and me with spiritual gifts to be used in His work. And I've said this a thousand times over. We are not the owners of these spiritual gifts. We are not the proprietor of these spiritual gifts. We are just stewards. How do you know what a steward is? A steward means to manage or look after another's property. Amen. Oh, Billy Graham. They quoted Billy Graham this past week. How many you got to see any of that yeah. wonderful funeral service? Oh my goodness! I, I come upstairs and down in my office. I come upstairs, and my wife sitting on the uh, on the uh, piece of furniture there in the middle before with the TV on, and she's weeping, just just listening to Franklin talk to his dad, listen to him telling the world what a, a tremendous father and and the children and and the grandchildren. Listen to me. Let me say this one more time. You must accept full responsibility. I'm going to make this quote. You must accept full responsibility. You must understand also that when you have what you have lost is something you have borrowed. God, if I say God, God, God has entrusted you and He has entrusted me. Look at somebody and say, God has trusted you. Tell somebody that God has trusted me. What what, that's just absolutely breathtaking, isn't it? Yes. God has entrusted you and me with spiritual gifts to be used in His work. We are not the owners of these spiritual gifts. We are just the stewards. We are to manage or look after God's property. Oh, I don't want to get off here and go rabbit shunning this morning. But I'm, I'm so tired of people taking all the praise and honor and glory, but yet saying all, all the glory to God. They're not giving glory to God. They're giving glory to themselves. Amen. A minister asked Billy Graham, he said, sir, what must I do in my ministry to be successful? Billy Graham said, don't make your ministry about you. Make it about Jesus. The ministry is not about you and me. It's not really my ministry. We all, and there's nothing wrong with that. We all say the ministry that God has given me. Well, you know, there's some... Uh, there's some solidity to that. There's some uh, uh, validity to that. But every gift that operates in our churches, in your life personally, in the pastor, in bishops, in whomsoever, those gifts belong to God. He is the proprietor of those gifts. And I'm just grateful that He's got enough of me to share those gifts, place them within me, so I can exercise them and be a blessing to someone else. I, I, I know that just knocks the light, the light out of some folks today, but every gift, every perfect gift comes from the Father, Amen. which is above. Amen. They're His gifts. Amen. I'm just grateful that He saw something in me. You've heard me say this a thousand times. I'm still trying to figure out what in the world He ever saw in me, Sheldon. What God ever saw in me that He would bless me the way He's blessed me is still beyond my comprehension. Yeah. I don't understand why God took a small town boy, turned his life around, hallelujah, lifted him up, placed his feet on solid ground, caused him to become a new creation in Jesus Christ, took my life, turned it around, made something out of me for His glory and honor. I'm 
praise the living God. Hallelujah. I know I talk too much. Politics to some of us here. It's not about politics, it's about being sensible. Being recognizing who we are. You know, now people, I heard a preacher say in this convention, we're not a Christian nation. Well, if depending on where you're looking. I'm looking at some fine Christian folk this morning. How many, how many are American citizens? You're not an illegal alien. If you are, you're going to go through the proper channel and get hooked up. <laughs> don't get me on that. I mean, that just don't make any sense at all. Praise the Lord. I'm proud to be an American. Amen. Amen. I'm not exactly sure of the proper grammar, but I'm, I'm more proud to be a born again, blood bought. Yes. Amen. Holy Ghost feel, yes. tongue talking, yes. believer. Yes. Hallelujah. Two valuable lessons to be learned from verse 6. First of all, before you can recover something that's lost, you have to go back to the place where it was found. Isn't that what we do when we lose something? We all know this. We try to recall the place we lost it, then retrace our steps until we find it. That's right. Trouble is, you get to a certain age. <laughs> You find yourself retracing more than you <laughs> find what you Well, you know, I don't mean to have you have your this morning. I have to have some little humor here. Yes. I kind of feel like Abraham Lincoln. Someone asked him if he was telling a joke and he's in the midst of the Civil War. I don't remember if we call my history right now. It's failing me to, to be exact, exact quote, but in essence, he, he was laughing in the midst of something that was not laughable. And, and one of his cabinet people sort of rebuffed him mildly, rebuked him. And how dare you, Mr. President, laugh at a time when it's so serious. And he said, if I don't laugh, if I don't have some humor, he said, I just, I, my emotions take over. And I, I, in, in essence, he said, I just, I just cannot deal with it. So, you know, that, that's the way I think many of us are today. I know I am as a preacher of the gospel. I'm, I was in Jeremiah and said, what my eyes see, sees, brings grief to my heart. There are seldom a day goes by, and I'm sure you share my heart with this. There are seldom a day that goes by that these eyes do not see something that does not, which does not bring grief to my heart. When you turn on your TV, I sent my 11 year old, just turned 11 years old. We did uh, last week, and he just walked up to, to this little uh, light pole away here, a little bit from the house. And after all these multiple killings, and, and you know, call it what you want to call it. Call it I, mean, I just think it's, I'm like Donald, I just think it's pure evil. Yeah. I'm still trying to figure out how you can just premeditate and plan a long line of killings. And, plan which door you're going in or which window you're going to go in. You already have a plan when you get there. You're going to ring the, uh, the fire alarm so everybody go out front so you can be standing there as the monster that he is. And many are when they do that. And all we want to do is cry mental illness. I know I understand mental illness. I've been around this. I've seen it. But I'm telling you, church, we, got, we have to start calling what it is what it is. Amen. Our, our, our young speaker, Tim Beck, he, he is one of them. He is a tremendous. I, I'd like to be able to stay here a few more years and retire. I'd love for you to come here and follow me. You don't deserve somebody that can preach the gospel. And this young man is just, he is just such a preacher. I don't mean he just jumps up and babbles. He is a preacher of the gospel. And he was teaching and he was preaching Friday night. And the youth were there, a few pastors. I wish more of us had been there, but there was only a few pastors there. And as this young man was preaching, I thought, oh God, I, I've known him for a number of years. He's, 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 just a, he's just a fine, fine minister of the gospel. 
And, and as he was preaching, he was, and some of the things he was saying, I could even see some of the ducks. It wasn't saying well with them. And I thought, you need to get over yourself. Mm-hmm. How are they going to hear without a preacher? Yeah. And if the preacher is going to stand up and declare. If we do not declare the whole counsel of God, I want somebody at the church this morning to tell me who's going to do this. And I declare the reason that many churches and many preachers of the gospel today are not declaring it. We've lost our spiritual head. We've lost our spiritual edge. We've lost our spiritual acts. And Tim said this. Oh God, he he had just torn off pieces. I mean, man, he just he was exploding with anointing. And he said, and he'd gone through different issues, encouraging the young people. And he said, what about the homosexual? And he got, you you could have heard of Penrock. And he made the reference, what about the homosexual? And he said, oh, he said, you wasn't expecting me to say that, were you? Well, no, most of them wasn't expecting him to say that. You see, it it, it, it even kind of got a little stick in here when I said that. The people the gospel is still the gospel and if we're not careful, we're going to lose our spiritual edge to where it's going to be difficult. It's going to be just like police enforcement because they're under such scrutiny because they can't do what they're commissioned to do. They become afraid. They become fearful because they have lost their spiritual axe head, if you will. They lost that position that they need to be in so they can declare, so they can stand up and be real men and women of the law enforcement field. We preach it it's the same way. Our local churches are the same way. The preaching is so shallow. It has no depth. It has no fervency. It has no anointing. Amen. Pastor, we have guests this morning. Hallelujah. You say, Pastor, that's why you don't have these pews filled. You just hold on. People are already growing weary with us. They're tired of this little sermonettes for Christianettes. I don't condemn people for smoking a cigarette, but I wouldn't. I think it's that one to your spiritual walk. But we have to have more than sermonettes. We can't survive on sermonettes. We can't survive on three minute sermons that does absolutely nothing for anyone. Preacher, do you have to get so excited? Yeah. <laughs> Would you ask my wife after church? Surely does he have to get all that excited? He's probably going to tell you if he does. <laughs> How can you not just get a little bit excited? Yeah, that's right. Amen. 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 Uh, I don't like that bookshop stuff either, but... Anyway, sometimes it's just the way it comes. <clears throat> Divine help had to be sought in order to recover what was lost. Now, make note of this. Already said first, before you recover something, you have to go back to the place that was lost. Anytime you lose your spiritual edge or your spiritual effectiveness and enthusiasm, you need to acknowledge where you lost it. Now listen carefully. I could have listed many, many things here. But these are probably of the most simplest. Did you lose your, your spiritual edge? Did it happen when you stopped reading your Bible and praying every day? Did it happen when you stopped going to church? Regularly, every 
Everybody shout regular. How often is regular? Easter? Christmas? Twice a year? Did it happen when you got upset over something that was said to you at church? Isn't it amazing how people fall out with Jesus when you should have kept them falling out with the person that you were offended at? Amen. You don't cast off the Lord because somebody says, well, I don't like that dress you're wearing today. You don't cast off Jesus because a preacher loses his mind and God knows where he goes from there. You don't break fellowship with God. <laughs> Did it happen when you got mad at the pastor and start tuning out his sermons? It's hard to tune mine. <laughs> kind of like going to sleep. It's hard to sleep while I'm preaching. It? It's not brag to me. It's just, you know, it's hard to sleep when somebody's screaming at you. Yeah. <laughs> Did it happen? Did you lose that spiritual edge? Did it happen when you went back to an old sinful habit? You see, our tendency is to keep chopping and chopping and not realize our spiritual accent is missing. Sometimes we preachers get so caught up in preaching sermons week after week and we don't realize we've lost our spiritual edge. Sometimes the power of the Holy Ghost is missing from our sermons. And because we have cultivated the spiritual gift, we may not always sense we're off. You can amen that. Sometimes Sunday school teachers get so caught up in studying. I'm just making general statements. Here. Sometimes Sunday school teachers get so caught up in, excuse me, in studying their lessons and presenting them every week that they fail to realize the spiritual edge has grown dull or it's missing altogether and the lessons just aren't affecting lives because there's no anointing in their teaching anymore. Mm -hmm. I cannot emphasize the anointing enough. Amen. Amen. I hear people talk about anointing. Anointing in their preaching, anointing in their teaching. Listen to me. Anointing, you can't see it with the tangible eye, but it's so discernible. Yes. There, there's something about a, a Sunday school teacher and, and Sister Melvin, you, you got it. Just, there's something about a teacher. And, and, and I, I, I say this many times. You don't have to, please don't ever misunderstand me. If you do, it's not for the lack of me telling you don't misunderstand me. You know, it's, it's, it's not about this moving. I think if I was in a wheelchair, paralyzed from neck down, I, whatever this is that explodes out of me week after week, I'm not going to lose that. And if I do, I have to take responsibility for it. But there's just something about Jen, even sin. I don't care what your gift is. I don't care what the gift is that God has allowed you to use for His glory. The gift is all about Him. I didn't even think about the nine gifts of the Spirit. You all know how I feel about this wholesale prophesying. Everybody just prophesying to somebody so they can get, in, so they can get, a, get their picture taken. That's not what the gift of prophetic utterance is about. The gifts that God, the nine gifts of the Spirit are gifts that belong to God. He is the proprietor. They are the gifts of the Spirit. Everybody say, gifts of the Spirit. You may say, well, I, yes, I do that. But you use it that gift. You have to remember. And when you mess up, I asked someone the other day, I said, well, what are you prophets going to do when you prophesy and only 80% of it comes to pass? What about the other 20%? Yeah. 
We don't want to neglect these gifts. I say to this meager congregation this morning, the Holy Spirit is moving in you and on you. And you feel desperate in your heart. God's crying in your spirit, crying out through you. You may not even understand it. I'm not even sure this can be taught. I know there's a lot of teaching going on about it. I'm kind of like speaking in another tongue. Yes. Unless, 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 unless you have studied uh, Godology and you understand what God understands, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that you can teach that because it's a special language. It's a, it's a special something in each individual's heart, the Holy Spirit. But it's all about the Spirit. Yeah. These gifts belong to the Spirit. Yeah. Sometimes church leaders get so caught up in going through the emotions in church business that they stop seeking the Lord's will in their decision making and lose not only their spiritual edge, they lose their vision and they lose their purpose. Oh God, help me today. In order to recover your spiritual edge, you must acknowledge where you lost it. Once you acknowledge where you lost your spiritual edge, you must rely on God's power to help you get it back. Amen. Well, stay right with this a little bit. Step out here again. I'm going to lose a very important part of this before I close. This is where <clears throat> repentance comes in. You must openly and honestly confess to God that you've lost your spiritual edge. Yes. By your own negligence, and you need the power of His forgiveness and the power of the Holy Ghost to recover your spiritual edge. Amen. Amen. Number three, conclusion. You must take action to recover your spiritual edge. Verse 7, Elisha said, pick it up for yourself. In the King James Version, verse 7, the prophet said to the young prophet, pick it up yourself. So he reached out his hand and took it. What was Elisha trying to teach this young prophet? By having him reach down and pick up the recovered axe head. Now, God, supernaturally, the axe head floated. Right. Amen. Now, he could have just commanded the axe head to float right over into the young prophet's hand that lost it. I'm telling you, saints, I, I don't want to... I, yeah, I don't want to bust your bubble if you believe this stuff. Th this teaching that's going on today that, and I do believe with all my heart, every past sin, every present sin, and every future sin has been forgiven. I heard someone say the other day, and I thought, oh, I wrote it down. I thought, I put a message together on that. He said, isn't it sad? People are going to hell. <clears throat> People are going to hell even after they've been forgiven. I don't know for a minute. How are you going to go to hell if you've been forgiven? Well, his, his thought was, because 2,000 years ago, <coughs> on an old on the cross, the Son of the living God, the second person in the Godhead, Jesus of Nazareth, the great healer, the great I Am, God Almighty, suspended between heaven and earth, precious blood flowed from Emmanuel's veins for the forgiveness of the sins of the world. But what we're failing in the church to recognize is, and I've said this 150 times from this pulpit, unrepentant sins are unforgiven sins. That's simply what he meant. People are going to heaven even having their sins because he paid it all. He did it all once and yes, he did. Yes, yes, he did. Amen. And sometimes we, and I regret this. It grieves my heart. I, I embraced young Tim back twice. I told him, I said, Tim, please don't ever let me hear that you're not preaching this gospel like this. Please, please, whatever you do, don't ever let me hear. You stop preaching this gospel. I said, do you realize men my age 
I still believe this gospel. I'll tell you, I still believe this gospel. Amen. 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 I believe it from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. From page to page, cover to cover, chapter to chapter. I still believe it is the living Word of God. Amen. I still believe it will change lives. But you've heard me say this before. I grow weary. We just act like all you got to do is say to Jesus when you were eight, eight and a half years old. Somebody said that they, I've been saved since I was eight years old. I thought that. Stuff I got mixed up in when I was a teenager, nobody did get mixed up in that. I wish I hadn't, but I did, but I'm forgiven. But do you know why I'm forgiven? First and foremost, because of what he did. Put your recovery your spiritual edge here. If you continue, if some of these church people, some of these preachers keep preaching, mm -hmm. that all you've got to do is one time believe it's a one time shot, that's ridiculous. Amen. Because if you believe August the 10th, 1953, when you were just a child, and you've committed sin after sin, and you walked in that sin, and you have failed to repent of those sins, I'm telling you, that's not on Jesus anymore. That's, that's, right. that's, right. I know that's a great debate over there. <gasps> he paid it all at once. But he said if you don't repent, mm -hmm. you're going to perish. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know what's so difficult. I, I, I don't know why Nancy Pelosi can't understand some things. Just that simple. You see, I've come quite. We take every responsibility. You don't have to responsibility. Amen. You just believe. You don't have any more responsibility. Yeah. You have no responsibility to live right. Somebody kind of made a correction over somebody preaching, telling people to stop sinning. Well, you better stop sinning. Amen. 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 I mean, do you, you, you understand what I'm saying? Now I realize mean, probably. A, a smidge of this, really, you, you can care less about what I'm saying right now. But you have to remember, you, we're not the only fish in pain. I live in a world that's filled with this. I live in a, we live in a church world that's filled with deception. Yes. Amen. Jesus has made it too simple, too precious, too valuable. And how dare any of us, how dare any of us abuse the precious blood I'm just going to finish it. Just let me get this one. When Elisha was trying to teach a young man, young prophet, I had him reach out and pick up the recovered axe head, reminded the young prophet of the value of what he had lost. He had lost something that belonged to another. He had lost something which he could not afford to repay quickly. Perhaps Elijah was teaching the young prophet a very valuable lesson on the grace of God. This young man was powerless to recover what he had lost. It was by God's grace. Oh, if we don't get this blended, if we don't get this right, if we don't put abusing grace, it was by God's grace and mercy it had been given back to him. Amen. Elijah wanted the young man to go back to chopping down trees. He recovered the cutting edge and was able to do what needed to be done. Amen. Once you accept your responsibility for losing your spiritual edge and you acknowledge where you lost it, by faith God wants you to pick it up, pick up what you lost, and start working effectively once again for Him. Amen. That means you must take action. If you've been neglecting God's word, listen to this quick, quickly. I'm, I'm winding you down. You need to get you need to get back into His word. If you're neglecting God's word, you need to get back into the word. If you're neglecting your prayer life, you need to get back into a regular habit of prayer. There, there's there's no amount there's there's no excessive teaching on prayer. You cannot pray. You cannot pray too much. So you need to get back into regular habit of prayer. If you've been neglecting your church attendance, you must renew your commitment to be in the Lord's house at least on the Lord's day. Amen. Go to church. <laughs> Did you hear me? Go to church. Amen. Look, somebody said the preacher's right. 
preach all right. I don't pay a lot of attention to him sometimes, but it's right. <laughs> It's not about legislating going to church. You know, there are churches we try to do. You legislate tithing. You start making people do anything, you've lost the sense of the sensitivity of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. These things are right to do, so anyway. I'll tell this little story quickly. The story has it that you've probably heard this. There were two men who competed against each other in a woodcutting contest. One man worked feverishly without stopping once for a break, while the other would work for a while, then take a break, work more, work some more, and then take another break. When the contest was over, the man who had worked so hard and took no breaks was amazed that his pile of wood wasn't nearly as large as the other man's. He turned to his competitor and asked, how in the world did you cut more wood than me with all those breaks you took? The man said, I wasn't wasting time while I was resting. I also took time to sharpen my axe. And I'm going to give you this. I pray that this is wisdom from heaven. When we're doing the Lord's work, it's important that we take time to sharpen See, I do know that. I'm not appreciating that new to anyone this morning. Sometimes we get so busy chopping away at life, we don't think we have time to stop and pray and study the Word and meditate on the greatness of God. When in reality, it is those things that help us keep our spiritual edge. Listen to this carefully. The axe head was there to solve a problem. When these students set in motion to cut down some trees, their attention was to get the job completed. Amen. Until the axe head fell off. Very familiar scripture. Cling to this. Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. With this this morning. Cling to this. Cling to this. Oh, for me, Scripture. Romans 11, verse 29. King James Version. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Without repentance simply means God won't change His mind about what He has called you to do. He's not fickle. See, I, I'm still trying to figure out what in the world he saw in me. I'm just saying he saw something in me. Amen. Even if I still can't figure it out after many, many decades. Mm -hmm. The gifts and the calling of God. Somebody really shared this this morning. I'm without repentance. God won't change his mind about what he's called you to do. Listen, to me. I, I, I've known too many people over here that try to get God change their mind. He's just not going to do it. What's he's got? Infinite wisdom, sovereign power, knows everything, declared the end from the beginning. Want we'll to try to figure that out, Steve? Yes, sir. So if in that period there, he looked down through the annals of time, he saw you, Brother Sheldon, he knew he was going to give you that wonderful voice. Yes, I think he preaches too. He looked down through that answer time. Just, just bear with me just a moment. Everyone you said here this morning, there's something in your life. I pray, we won't take the time, obviously. <laughs> Everyone of you could stand here this morning and say to me, Pastor, I, I really feel God is calling me. Sometimes people confront me and tell me about it, tell me something that says, you know, I, I don't really know what to do with it. I mean, I, I don't walk on water. But I don't do the call. I don't walk on water. I didn't hang the sun, the moon, the stars. That's right. That's right. But whatever calling, whatever gifting that He's given to you, I believe this is all my for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. I think one of the uh, New Living Translations something says that the gift and calling of God are irreversible. 
It just simply means God won't change his mind. If he's called you, if God has called you, listen carefully, that calling is still there. Whether or not you have obeyed, and if God gave you a gift and gifted you in a certain area, that gift is still there. You may say, preacher, all these years have gone by. I could never make it up. I don't know that God's expecting you to make up anything. I think God's just expecting us to be obedient to Him. Amen. And if He's thought enough of you, whatever that gift is, I know there's a stretch on all of this and you know, people are writing books about it. But I'll tell you, you can really get about 200% of what you need right out of this. And you can understand your calling. I declare it to you this morning. You can understand your calling. It may take you a while. I'm speaking to someone this morning. It may take you a while. You may be trying to chase something that's not there. I've known preachers that, you know, that really wanted to be. Don't, don't want to be anything but what God wants you to be. Amen. You've heard me say this before? Kid preacher in Bible school many, many years ago. Everybody wanted to preach like Edward Matthews. They wanted to preach like D. Frank Hughes or Felix Garcia. For whatever rhyme or reason, that spirit didn't fall on. God, I still try to figure out what is he doing there. I thought, I don't want to preach like somebody else. I don't want to be somebody else. I don't want someone else's gift. I just want to work on this one that you have given to me. I want to, I want to give myself. Oh, I'm, I'm talking to someone this morning. You can't get away from it. You cannot get, there's no worse. Like David said, where shall I go to flee from the presence of the Lord? I had an elder, a minister, he's been, he's been with the Lord for many years, great minister of God. He told me one time, he said, I joined the army, just get away from the call of God. I said, you, joined, you didn't think God was in the army? You, you just simply, I, I, I don't know why I feel this so strong. You just simply can't get away from this. Well, I just can't make it. I, I can't afford to. I can't afford not to do what he's called me to do. Amen. If I leave for the 24th day of next month, Oh, I could, I could have really hugged it over last night. He said, he said, Bishop said, how old are you? I said, well, if I live to the 24th day of April, I'll be 69 years old. He said, nah. I didn't think you were that old, man. I want to hug him again. <laughs> and you know, sometimes, obviously, we all, Bishop Lawson, you, uh, many have, have retired, some because of physical uh, conditions, etc. And there, there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes when I get trying to really plan to retire, I, I, I hear something. I, I see something like the axe head coming out of the deep water. <laughs> something happens. Or I, 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 I turn on my TV and I hear this, I hear this limp-wristed preaching. I hear this stuff that has no, uh, it, it's so diluted and caramel-coated and sugar-coated and diluted and watered down. If he calls you, the call's still there. But the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Let him sharpen your axe this morning. Let something supernatural take place in your life like it hasn't in a long, long time or maybe it never has happened. And while you're sitting back and meditating, contemplating, and while you listen at yourself, I told someone yesterday, I said, I don't know what this age was, but I said, I've become a habitual complainer since I've been in this convention. <laughs> it's too cold or it was too hot. So, but if he's, if he's calling you, it doesn't matter how long ago it was, if he's calling you, he can revive it. All he has to do, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And dead for four days, come forth. Lazarus, come forth. 
He can resurrect your calling. He can give you back your spiritual edge. Church, we need a spiritual edge for a lot of things in these last days. I'm telling you, if there's any gift of the nine gifts of the Spirit, then we all need to pray that God will help us. That's discernment. Unbelievable the things that I hear that people believe. Why do you believe that? Well, that's what that preacher said. 